Hello everyone, my name is Ralph Carter and today I'm going to talk about a network centric to application centric migration uh, based on a, an existing environment, a brownfield environment, uh, not really a greenfield. Greenfield would be a little bit different obviously. So this would be more on uh, based on a, um, an existing environment where you know customer applications are uh, functional within the existing legacy environment. I'm going to touch on a couple of on a couple of um, you know ways to kind of migrate the workloads into ACI, and then obviously um, when the workloads are in ACI, what what happens next? So uh, let's take a look at the design here. All right, so again, this will be a brownfield edition uh, based on network centric application centric migration. So uh, what I want to kind of do is paint a picture of what a legacy environment will look like. In this particular case, we have VLAN 10. We're going to use VLAN 10 as our example. But again, um, this, this model or this, uh, this approach would be uh, applicable to all VLANs, right? Uh, in this case, I'm using VLAN 10. And um, in VLAN 10 here, uh, let's say we have shared services, right? So, so for example, um, this particular subnet that is uh, that this VLAN is bound to, um, you know, the the customer has um, deployed many applications that had to do with, for example, Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, um, IP address management, syslog, different network management and monitoring tools, right? Kind of like infrastructure services. Okay, so they're all on VLAN 10. Um, now they're also connecting the VLAN 10s, uh, the, the default gateway for this uh, subnet would be obviously um, on the core switch. Uh, it could be also on the routed access, it really doesn't matter. Um, there's got to be obviously a default gateway somewhere and in, in modern networks, you know, they're typically on a layer 3 switch, right? So there's an SVI for VLAN 10, we're looking at 10, 10, 10, 1, slash 24 as the default gateway. That default gateway or that uh, layer three uh, device is uh, again whether it's on a routed access or it's on a core switch of some sort at the data center. Um, what I'm showing here is that some layer two top of rack switch connects into the compute layer, as an example. So the compute layer here, um, what we have is a typical trunk interface. Now this could connect down to Cisco UCS, HPC 7000, IBM. It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, all we know is that we have some type of network connectivity um, that arrives at the network switch, right? And what we are doing is we're passing VLANs into uh, down, down a trunk through the um, servers, right, um, into the hypervisor layer, right, into the VMware layer at this point, right? And at the VMware layer, we have one or more port groups, and those port groups are mapped to various VLANs, right? So in this particular case, what we're doing is we're trunking VLAN 10 from the switches down into the hypervisor world, and then we have a port group that maps to that VLAN 10, okay? And on that VLAN 10 port group, we have a number of legacy servers, right? Virtual machines, right? All kind of grouped together. Uh, and for this particular scenario, use case, I'm just kind of showing eight virtual machines. Um, and I'm sure customers have a lot more than eight virtual machines. Uh, but in this case, I want to show how we would handle migrating these workloads into ACI and then moving to either an application centric or a hybrid uh, approach and then um, assigning contracts and and kind of providing some macro or micro level uh, segmentation. So um, in this scenario, the traffic flow again from the virtual machines would go up into the hypervisor world, the hypervisor would forward it up to the um, uplink into the network switch and then up into the default gateway and the default gateway will basically switch it to another SVI or up to upstream to a firewall or WAN router or wherever that traffic has to go. But this is typically the, 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 the traffic pattern um, in the legacy environment for now for this use case. So what we want to do is we want to model this legacy environment in ACI, right? Now there's a lot of different strategies on doing that. Uh, I'm not going to go into that detail in this video. I'll probably make another video on that. But what I'm going to do is let's say that VLAN 10 is part of the core routing table. So I'm going to create uh, a core tenant, and obviously I need a VRF to be um, 
compliant with Cisco ACI's um, construct model, right? So we have a tenant. Within a tenant, we have one or more virtual routing and forwarding instances, okay? So in this case, we create core VRF. And then we start creating the, the um, other legacy constructs and modeling them. So one of the things we would do is create a bridge domain. Now, one strategy I have is um, if VLAN 10, in this case, is used for shared services, and if I do a, a show VLAN uh, brief on the switch and it kind of comes up and says, oh, this is shared services, I usually use the name of the VLAN and I move that uh, and, and I, and I um, take the name and I name the bridge domain um, to reflect the VLAN. I do not use the VLAN ID on the bridge domain name because in ACI VLANs really don't matter. And if I take it down, you know, to a, an application centric approach, that VLAN 10, you know, it's going to get a little messy because that VLAN 10 really doesn't mean anything anymore, right? So in this particular case, I, I try to stay away from whatever the legacy VLAN ID was as part of the bridge domain name. So in this case, I know it's shared services, so I'm going to create a shared services bridge domain to reflect that, right? And one thing to note is that um, in ACI, VLANs are not used the same way as in traditional networks, right? VLANs are not, VLANs in traditional networks are used for segmentation, isolation, you know, you, you uh, endpoints on a VLAN, uh, they're, you know, you, you design specific uh, VLANs for, for, for subnet, um, for, for broadcast saturation reasons, you want to you contain everything within a VLAN, and that's kind of part of that subnet, right? Um, in this particular case, in ACI, uh, VLANs are just used to uh, used as a classifier or as a, some kind of attachment um, mechanism, meaning like, for example, I'm going to connect this virtual machine uh, with VLAN 10, or I'm going to connect the load balancer on VLAN 10. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really not used um, for anything more than that, right? So um, the, the bridge domain actually is. The bridge domain takes place of a actual VLAN in, in ACI. And again, we're just using the VLANs as a, as a classification or, or some kind of attachment point into the ACI fabric to kind of um, classify what that device is, right? So let's kind of go through that real quick. So um, I created my uh, shared services bridge domain. These are my network constructs. The shared services bridge domain obviously is part of the core VRF. And then I start creating other constructs like a shared services ANP, which is my application profile. Okay. So the application profile is going to contain my endpoint group. In this particular case, I am going to use the VLAN ID, okay, and the VLAN name of my legacy traditional network in ACI because for migration reasons, I'm going to want to know exactly which. Um, group of devices or, or what networks or VLANs I'm actually migrating. It'll just be easier in the long run, uh, eliminate a little, little bit of the human error, um, and it'll make things a little bit easier. Uh, because I know for a fact that if I do go into a networks, uh, I'm sorry, an application centric model, this EPG is just temporary. It's going to go away. And I'm going to explain to you what that means. So um, one of the things I'm also going to create is a layer three out, right? Uh, the layer three out is just a uh, appearing or adjacency. It's a layer three um, connection out of the VRF, just like in uh, traditional networks, right? You have a virtual routing and forwarding instance, and you need to be able to um, create a connection out of the VRF, whether it's, you know, peering with a firewall or, um, uh, or you know, connecting to some other uh, fusion router or some sort or, or something, right? So in this particular case, I create a, a WAN layer three out, um, and that peers with a firewall router, or whatever. It just kind of gets out of the uh, virtual routing and forwarding um, instance. And on the WAN layer three out, I also have um, EPGs that I can define. In this case, external EPGs. So uh, that would be something else that would be defined. I'm not going to go into that in this particular use case. And as part of my network-centric migration, I'm going to configure all um, of the EPGs as part of the preferred group, right? The preferred group is like the elite class, right? Like you're standing, um, you know, at the airport in, 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 in the business class or first class line, group one, right? You're part of the elite class and everybody part of that group kind of has the same 
uh, treatment, right? They all board the, the plane at the same time. So this particular case in, in, in ACI, uh, in the ACI world, everybody that's part of the preferred group or all endpoints that are part of the uh, preferred group can communicate together. They're, they're, they can, you know, there's no, um, no security um, challenges. Like everybody can communicate with everybody, right? Loose enforcement. So what I'm going to do then is when I created these ACI constructs, now I create an EPG extension into the legacy environment, right? And all this is at this point, it's just a trunk connection to the legacy switch between the uh, between either a service leaf or a border leaf or some kind of leaf in ACI that allows me to connect into the legacy environment. So this would be a, uh, a trunk interface connected from my leaf switch to the legacy switch. And all I'm doing in this particular use case is passing uh, VLAN 10 on this trunk. Okay. Then um, what I do is I plan my migration and I physically unplug the connections from the legacy switch and I plug them into the switch in ACI. Again, probably the compute leaf. And on the compute leaf, um, what I do is make sure that, you know, I have my policies, my fabric access policies configured correctly. And on the EPG level, I just create a static binding. Okay, so um, if this was Cisco UCS, then I probably have uh, virtual port channels. And those port channels with the static binding of VLAN 10 uh, would be assigned to this EPG. Okay. So what that would effectively create is now any communication from the legacy environment would go through the ACI fabric back into the legacy environment up to the default gateway, right? So uh, typically these are the strategies that you would use. You would move, you know, one or more workloads or uh, one or more compute environments um, until you're kind of comfortable with the process. And, you know, you're still going to use the legacy network as the default gateway because that's kind of where everything lives from a routing standpoint. And, um, you know, you, you're, you're kind of you kind of want to test out ACI. You want to make sure that, you know, your workloads are, are properly function at a layer two standpoint. Right. Where in this case, ACI is, pro, uh, is acting as a layer two fabric, um, you know, kind of like a tr layer two transit. Um, it's not you're not leveraging any. Uh, contracts or, or uh, layer three when layer three outs or anything uh, of that nature uh, as of yet, right? There's no default gateway. So you kind of test this out. You're happy. Everything's working. Now what you're going to do is you're going to shut down the SVI on the legacy uh, environment and you're going to enable the, uh, a subnet or a default gateway on the shared services bridge domain. And at the same time, you're going to map the shared service bridge domain to the WAN layer three out. So by creating this, this uh, default gateway on the bridge domain, this actually creates an SVI on the leaf switch, actually on all the leaf switches, all the leaf switches that are in scope. Okay. So in this particular case, what happens is all traffic is actually from these uh, VLAN 10 workloads is going to hit the ACI fabric when trying to communicate with anything outside of the, um, the, the network, right? Uh, outside of its network, outside of the VLAN 10 network. And, um, you know, that could be something that goes through the WAN layer 3 out, or it could be something that goes to another uh, bridge domain in ACI, depending on, you know, how far you went with your uh, migration. Now, there's also a couple things that are happening behind the scenes. You know, the WAN layer 3 out also has a layer 3 connection into the legacy world, and it's advertising the 10.10.10.0/24 subnet out in that direction. I'm not going into those weeds uh, here. I'm just kind of keeping it simple. But note that yes, you are going to have some kind of layer 3 peering from your layer 3 out. Um, and you are going to be advertising this new subnet through the WAN layer 3 out, and it's not going to be advertised no more from the interface VLAN 10 or the, the switch that was hosting interface VLAN 10. So if you are doing some summary, um, uh, you know, r route summaries, obviously you have to put all that into consideration. Um, so in this case, there will be a new ingress egress point for, for this uh, 101010 uh, subnet. So now, you know, you have to make a determination. 
am I okay with network centric mode? Do I want to just kind of operate in this mode? Or do I want to take it a little bit you know, further? Do I want to kind of start moving into a hybrid or application centric mode where I'm going to start you know, um, um, dissecting this VLAN 10 and kind of creating uh, additional endpoint groups to kind of create more of a application centric model, right? And then start putting in some security controls between different endpoint groups. Because right here, if we only have one endpoint group, obviously we're in a preferred group, but there's really, it's, it's very difficult to put security contracts around um, something like this, right? Because yes, we can have separate bridge domains and they, they can also have different endpoint groups, but you're really not gonna be creating contracts between in, in this network centric model because it becomes very difficult and it just doesn't make sense. You can, um, at this point, start leveraging, for example, taboo contracts and, and deny traffic. For example, if there's a virus outbreak and you want to put a stop to certain uh, port communication, yeah, you can apply a taboo contract and it, it, it will achieve, um, you know, some, some blacklisting for you. Okay. Uh, so that is definitely uh, uh, something that will be available. But in this particular case, you know, I want to start moving into an application-centric or hybrid mode. Now, how do I start breaking up that VLAN 10 EPG, right? I have to, I need some type of application dependency mapping or some kind of more, I need more information about what, vir, what physical and virtual systems or in general, what endpoints are actually connected in VLAN 10, right? So what I typically do then is start mapping out applications. Now this process can be as simple as, hey, just talking with application owners and conducting interviews, which, you know, in a lot of cases, um, probably, you know, even the application owners don't know how their applications work, but you'd be surprised there are some, um, some networks where application owners have proper documentation about what ports are used within their applications, okay? So, um, you know, you can use that. Um, that well, you, you would definitely want to use something, uh, something along those lines and definitely interview application owners um, at, at some point as well, right? But you could also look, use other tools, like for example, SPAN. SPAN with ACI, you can do either local or ER SPAN. Um, for example, have the traffic uh, mirrored out to like a, a, a Nexus data broker or um, or a Gigamon, which is a very popular deployment, right? And the, there's there's a lot of deployment models around, you know, um, whether you're doing local or your span local would basically be um, on every uh, um, switch, okay? You would connect, uh, every leaf switch you would connect to a, a Gigamon or some kind of um, a span device, right? Versus ER span, you would probably maybe dedicate some service leaves and um, establish connectivity to a collector, to a span collector, and then you know you would ER span it uh, through the through the uh, ACI fabric backbone or spine backbone, right? So there are, there are some design considerations there. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I have done it and it works well. Uh, then there's third-party NetFlow and or Tetration. When I say third-party NetFlow, okay, so you can use tools like, I don't know, SolarWinds or uh, VRNI from VMware uh, works pretty good. Um, it, you know, depending on what um, license package you have. So, for example, the enterprise uh, license will give you uh, NetFlow collection from um, external devices. Uh, but if you are just targeting VMware, then, you know, VRNI works great because you could just configure the virtual distributed switch to export, you know, IP fixed traffic to, to VRNI. And now, you know, pretty much all the communications that are happening at a, at a VM level, right? And that's very, very useful uh, when you're trying to uh, create security policy within an ACI fabric or just any, any, any network in general. And then you obviously have Tetration. Tetration is Cisco's tool. Um, you can uh, forward all traffic to Tetration, and Tetration will be able to give you more of a visibility. And Tetration also has other uh, security uh, capabilities as well. And then obviously contracts, so uh, logging the contracts and or sending to syslog, right? So I can, um, I can pretty much create a log uh, between uh, different EPG communications just to, just to kind of see what's, what, um, what ports are used, log that to a syslog. I mean, I wouldn't really use that as a, as a long-term solution because, you know, there's some overhead, 
with, with the logging, right? I only kind of use the, the logging feature just to make sure that there is some kind of uh, communication in, in the path and more for like troubleshooting reasons, to be frank. Okay, so at this point, I mapped out my applications. I used some tools, some strategies to kind of understand, you know, in this case, what the hell is happening in VLAN 10, you know, which VMs are doing what, what, you know, like let's say V.10, uh, 11, 12, or domain controllers or whatever, right? I get all this additional information and I know what's communicating with what. So in this case, what I would do is um, through my application, um, you know, dependency mapping, I, I'm, I now understand that there's a number of infrastructure services and there's some also some uh, infrastructure management, for example, Netflow collectors or syslog servers or whatever, right? So I start creating and modeling EPGs based on, you know, what I discovered, right? And when I create these additional endpoint groups in ACI, I also put them into a preferred group because I don't want uh, to knock out communication. I don't want to you know, I want to start off with migrating into an application centric, but also making sure that the communication is, is free just as it was under the VLAN 10 EPG, right? I want to, I want to maintain minimal disruption here. So in this particular use case, uh, I have these two additional EPGs and then I start, you know, in this case, I might may, I may use VMM integration um, where you know, um, you know, there's the uh, traditional VDS integration or there's the AVE, right? The uh, ACI Virtual Edge. Uh, regardless, um, what basically happens is behind the scenes is that ACI um, instructs uh, the hypervisor layer to create specific port groups and manages the VLAN back port groups that the um, virtual machines consume a part of their virtual network interface cards, right? I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I don't want to get into the weeds of how VMM integration works. Um, long story short, it can definitely assist and aid you in uh, moving into an application-centric model because you don't have to manage all the different VLAN ID mappings for all the uh, port groups that, you know, you would have had to create manually, right? So you're kind of relieving the a VMware administration team from from managing all these crazy port groups now because you have all these um, you know new security initiatives. So if we did have VMM integration or you know we did it manually at the VMware layer, we would have the infra services EPG and we would have the infra management EPG. And because we did our mappings, we know that we can uh, tell now the uh, VM or administration team to say, hey, listen, um, the 10, 11, 12, 13, map them to a new port group because I know those servers are Active Directory servers and InfoBlock servers, and then any future infrastructure services that you want to deploy, okay, then map them to this new port group. And don't worry about what VLAN ID is being used because either ACI is managing it or, you know, it's a new VLAN ID that we're going to sign for you if you're doing static bindings, right? So in this case, I move my uh, four virtual machines that I know provide infrastructure services, and I also move two other virtual machines, uh, and I put them under the infra management EPG. In this case, they're you know syslog servers or Netflow collectors, you know devices that I would use to manage the infrastructure. Right, kind of categorize them um, correctly. Okay, so. Um, what I would do, obviously, uh, make sure that all these three EPGs are part of the preferred group because when the VMware administration team uh, changes the uh, NIC interface on them, right, um, they're going to be able to communicate with the other endpoints in VLAN 10 in the same way, and there will be no communication issues, right? Uh, so I want to kind of make sure that that is still maintained. And, you know, the other benefit is that the application doesn't really know uh, that any changes happen because its IP address is the same, um, DNS is the same, it's communicating in the same way. So everything is pretty much the same. So again, I have, in this case, those EPGs uh, mapped to my legacy VLAN 10 servers. I have my um, infra services, Active Directory info blocks, and then I have my infra management, syslog, and, and netflow, okay? And they're grouped at a macro level, right? Um, can you just call out 
domain controllers and then InfoBlock servers by themselves? Yes, but truthfully, uh, doing these deployments with customers, they, they prefer to do a macro level. Um, it's just a lot easier, to, especially to get comfortable with ACI, uh, because doing a micro level in a brownfield, it's you know, it's it's just it's going to be a little messy, in my opinion. So start off with a macro level, um, in my opinion, but you know, you're you're free to do whatever you want, actually. So in this particular case, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start prepping this environment. So I'm going to create an infra services contract. And I'm also going to create an infra management contract. Now, based on the application dependency mapping tools or strategy, I know what ports are needed for communication with the Active Directory InfoBlock servers. And I know what ports are needed for Syslog and the Netflow collector, right? So what I do is I populate these contracts with those ports, and the contracts have something called filters, right? Filters. Um, where, for example, uh, think of filters as access control entries, right? What, uh, what individual ports, uh, part of an access list, are allowed to be, um, are, are in scope, are allowed to communicate, right? So in this case, I'm, I'm creating my contract and I have filters defined with what ports are, uh, are allowed. Then, when I'm ready, all I have to do is go to my infra service EPG and, uh, and management and I remove them from the preferred group. In this particular case, um, they're, they're out of this you know, elite class. They go to group two on the airline, right? So you know, group one is still VLAN 10, but group two is infra services and infra management, which basically means that I have to create a contract with those EPGs to be able to communicate and vice versa, right? So what I would do is I would provide this contract on the infra service EPG and infra management EPG, and I would set up VZNE, which basically means any endpoint group in the ACI fabric, right? Um, I would make them a consumer. So in this particular case, anybody in the network, any um, endpoint group, and pretty much any endpoint can consume Infra services based on the ports uh, or filters defined in the infra services contract, and based on uh, and on the infra management EPG uh, based on the infra management contract and, and its uh, filters or ports. Okay. You may wonder also. Well, what about if the infra management endpoints need to communicate with Active Directory? How will that work? Well. Because we have VZNE defined, they technically are part of VZNE because that's any endpoint group, and they will be able to also connect to Active Directory and Black servers based on the infra services contract. So it would work um, uh, in that fashion as well. Now, what I could also do is take it a, a step further. Now that I created this base EPG of infra services EPGs, I can now create micro seg EPGs and uh, take it uh, one level down and say, okay, well, I want to, you know, I want to separate my Active Directory uh, servers from my InfoBlock servers, and I would do that with, for example, the microsec policies, where um, if I don't have a VMM integration, then I'm limited to um, you know, maybe looking at IP address or MAC address, and if I do have VMM integration, um, then I could look at things like VM attribute, host name, uh, tag. Uh, pretty much all the all the various um, VMware uh, attributes that are available because now they're exposed to the um, to Cisco ACI and Cisco ACI can can use them for uh, different classification uh, um, requirements, right? So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I know this was kind of high level, but for anybody that tries to understand, well, what what does it take to migrate to network centric, and then when you're in network centric, what do you do next? What are some options? Um, so that's basically uh, what you would do to migrate into an application-centric uh, model. Okay. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, if you did enjoy, it, please subscribe to my channel, and you know um, I'll be releasing some uh, some videos in the future, and uh, you'll get notified. So please subscribe. Thank you.